Good afternoon. It's uh, February 19th. It's 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And uh, this is your House Education Committee. And we are um, going to be discussing this afternoon um, an act relating to equitable access to high quality education through community schools. And we have a guest, Andrew Labarge. Welcome. And um, you can start anytime. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you um, for letting me speak as a witness to uh, House Bill H-106. I'm going to say that. My name is Andrew Labarge, um, and I've been teaching third grade at Molly Stark Elementary in Bennington uh, since 2014. Um, I'm actually a lifelong resident of New York, but I have roots in Arlington. Um, my work in my school doesn't end at the end of the school day. Um, I'm a building leader. I'm uh, the treasurer of my local association, and I was the summer school coordinator at Molly Stark before the COVID uh, epidemic struck. I um, have also been on the negotiations team for my local uh, for the last three years, and enough about me, I, uh, because the reason we're speaking today is in support of community schools in Vermont. Um, I'd like to talk about how Molly Stark has been a model um, of how we can create a community school. Um, Molly Stark has uh, been the center of our community for a very long time. The name uh, actually comes from our uh, famous patriot and wife of General John Stark, Molly Stark. She was a great caregiver to the colonists as they fought the British in the Revolutionary War. Molly was known for feeding and caring for so many people um, that her name became synonymous with uh, community service. So the Molly Stark Elementary School has evolved somewhat from its early model as community school, but many of the services that are still available um, to students and families in the community. So for many years, we um, had an outreach, a family at Molly Stark Outreach was uh, headed up by our assistant principal. And there was never a day that you would get to school before her or leave after her. And the time that she spent coordinating um, everything that families needed was just amazing. She she knew everything about every family that came to our school. Um, for a while, with her leadership, we were really truly a community school. Today, Molly Stark Elementary is a part of a large school district that has uh, six elementary schools, middle school, high school, and in our newly named Tech Center. Molly Stark is located in uh, Uptown Bennington. It's surrounded by multiple community housing developments that provide low-income housing for many Benningtonians. Um, many residents of the nearby community have limited resources in transportation. So the location of the school has been an important part of its role as a community school. Molly Stark provides uh, free breakfast and uh, lunch for all learners. And um, another service that um, the lo we had for the local community before COVID was we would open the parking lot up to the local food pantry truck uh, Veggie Van Gogh and, uh, on the first and third Wednesdays every month. Now, Molly Stark uh, provides education for learners in kindergarten through fifth grade. And uh, on site, there's also a pre-K program for three and four-year-olds uh, in the early childhood education program. This program provides a head start for many learners. Uh, even though it's only a few hours a day, it, it gives children the opportunity to interact with other children in social and emotional relationships. Um, this program also helps trained educators identify early learning problems and, and provides a head start in identifying special ed needs. Um, so the Early Childhood Education Group uh, also provides an opportunity for the school age children to attend an, uh, a before and after school care. Um, early at 7 a.m. they can come in and, and uh, after school they can stay until 5.30. Um, in addition to these uh, early learning programs, Molly Stark had um, always provided um, after school for years for all learners. Um, after school runs 3 to 4.30, four days a week. Uh, and um, the programs usually run like six week sessions with uh, three sessions a year. So of course with the COVID 19 pandemic, many of these services have been suspended. 
Uh, in addition to the after school program, the district maintains a minimal $20,000 budget to administer a summer school program for all learners. Uh, like, as I said, I, I was he heading that up. Um, in 2019, we had about 80 of our 380 learners uh, attend the four week summer learning program. Program ran four days a week, um, four hours a day, and breakfast and lunch are provided. So um, some other community engagement activities at Molly Stark and some of the other schools in the district include uh, math nights and literacy nights, open house uh, and more. And these programs facilitate family learning activities. They, many of the families attend and from my experiences, when you provide the food, they, the attendance seems to increase as well. Um, so the New England uh, Center for Children, uh, we call it NEC, it's N-E-C-C -C in the acronym. It's housed in inside of the Molly Stark building uh, and it provides educational, emotional, physical support for the children in the autism spectrum. Uh, this program integrates learners into our regular ed classrooms wherever possible and it provides individual education plans for each learner. The program uh, has been great success in the community and it really provides families with the tools that they need to help the children right in their community, in their school. Um, Molly Stark uh, holds attendance challenges and provides awards for families that uh, to get their kids you know, to school every day. Um, we provide tutoring programs throughout the school year. And some programs can uh, be continued over the summer months to ensure some reading, writing, and, and math skill practice. Molly Stark has created and continues to provide uh, the Molly Stark Scholarship Fund, which is awarded to Molly Stark graduates um, when they go on to attend college. Now, another really important part of the community model is the health services. And providing these services in the school building instead of in a healthcare setting is beneficial for families. Um, in a lot of ways. At Molly Stark, we had, we've had for a long time an audiologist in the building uh, on site with one of the most uh, advanced hearing centers in the region. Not only is the hearing center available for our learning community, but it's also available for the public by appointment for, elder, for the elderly. Um, the health office uh, at Molly Stark has two full-time nurses on staff and they can assess learners' vision and general health. Um, they also provide medical services like medication delivery, glucose monitoring, insulin injections for the kids in the in elementary age. Um, Molly Stark is one of the few places that actually provided dental care within our school building. Uh, Dr. Brady was our provider. He, care, he retired a few years ago, but he held uh, some of his dental practice at the school in Molly Stark. He would deliver the dental services to children from families that needed dental care but were unable to provide for their children. So part-time hygienist still works with many of the learners, but uh, since Dr. Brady's retirement, the services inside the building have kind of been interrupted. Mental health is also a really necessary service that must be available to students and families in the community, especially in this COVID world, mental health needs just must be addressed. So uh, Molly Stark employs two full-time counselors and we use, um, area mental health staff as well from the DCF uh, to provide counseling for learners of trauma and poverty. Um, Molly Stark works in conjunction with the Sunrise Family Resource Center in town, which uh, provides counseling, parental support, home visits, and, and much more. All of these components are crucial in creating a community school that works to improve the health and the well-being of the people in the local community. Factors that are um, difficult are often too much for families and they, they're unable to provide the necessary care for their children. So having more schools in Vermont that use the community school model to improve the overall health and mental well-being of the community is important. I'm excited that uh, this committee is, is considering H106 and I hope you will move forward uh, this concept. I believe that the pilot model and vision could be very helpful to building existing and new supports for our students and communities. The, this pandemic has just exasperated these needs um, for schools to just create these partnerships with the community. So thanks and um, I'm happy to answer questions. I apologize for reading a script, but I wanted to make sure I said enough uh, to address this. So 
Thanks. Thank you. And Representative Kupali, I am back. Um, sorry, um, Kate Webb here. Um, I had the, I was fortunate enough to visit your school uh, last year, and it was really, uh, really a wonderful experience. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks, and I apologize. I arrived a few minutes late, and you may have already gone over this. Um, but in the uh, Southern Vermont Supervisory Union, is Molly Stark your largest elementary school? Yeah, yeah, Molly um, has, we average around three to 400 kids around, um, and then then another one is around 200. So we are, yeah, substantially larger. And um, with that in mind, I guess, first of all, do um, families of the other schools in your supervisory union have access to these services? And then my bigger question is more, um, you know, uh, uh, how big a school is, is needed to, to be a good, com, um, you know, community school? Great question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a there's an answer for the size. It, it's more of the the need in the in, in the community, and um, this the answer to the first question. I'm not really sure. How, you know, again, I, um, you know, Molly was kind of a, a, a separate kind of unit for a while, kind of in its own. And then the other schools are more downtown. Then some of the other elementary schools added to the district, like Shaftesbury is a little out off the district. Uh, Poundell's a little south of there. You know, a lot of um, community needs in their own in their own aspects. So you know, it's certainly something that um, would work in in any place that that needs. So you know, in, in implementing the dental plan into the school is really you know it's just a, a matter of getting a chair and, and getting a dentist to commit to that. But, um, you know, time and effort to, to get people involved in that is, is, a, is a part. And I, and, I, and I just, you know, today it's a little bit different. Again, um, you know, the school district's evolved quite a bit. We've re-consolidated um, into a, a new district as well. So, so there are things. But it's just the idea that, that you know, can be done uh, per school within districts as well. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Thanks. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Representative Coopley. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it seems that the, you offer, Molly Stark offers a, a great amount of services to not only the students, but the entire community. Um, do you do fundraising um, or have benefactors contributing to these programs? Yeah, and there was... Um, some questions I think that um, said, uh, Representative Webb that they answered a lot with the early ed program. I think she was in some of it was grant money that, that provided a lot of this. Um, and the work was done, you know, th through the early ed program to, to uh, get that implemented. Um, and I'm trying to think of um, the um, so you asked first part of your question. Could you repeat that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, my my uh, question basically goes around fundraising. Yeah, that's right. We, we do have a lot of fundraising. A lot of it's done through our, our PTG now, like the PTG really uh, works with our, our leadership team in Molly Stark. Um, obviously everything's changed with COVID. So we, we would do a number of, of fundraisers that money would go into uh, things for those family nights and things like that, that, that gets funded through there. Um, again, I, um, that 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 helps. The the summer school funding kind of was budgeted for years, uh, and that's in addition to our, you know, special ed uh, summer program because that's kind of a different um, entity. The summer program is for all all learners, and uh, it's pretty neat. But COVID's kind of changed all that. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Brady. All right, thank you, Representative Coopley. You, you sort of asked my question and trying to understand, I mean, it just sounds, having not been able to visit yet, sounds amazing and how you've been able to do that and the funding for so long. Um, but I also wonder, one of the things we're wrestling with in this bill is, is community schools that exist within a district and who's the sort of, um, it administers this and is it a school program or is it a district program? And so since you started at that school level, but now you're part of a bigger district, have there been any challenges or issues since you've become part of a district into keeping up your model? I, I think it's good for us to think about in terms of how we set this up. 
Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, um, you know, I think it was, I, 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 I'm, I wasn't around long enough to, again, uh, there are some people that I, we could talk to about what it was like 25 years ago um, and, and, and is a real solid model of, of the community school. I think, I think that there, there's lots of great things done within our district that, that promote the same kind of things within schools. Um, it definitely um, has to do with how uh, the administration in that school runs and, and how the community responds to what these schools are offering. So, um, you know, as you, as you offer more things and you get more people involved, uh, you can, you can start that in, in another school. So with it, within that, um, you know, I think that the, the other larger elementary school in, in um, would certainly benefit from having those health services inside it, it as well. Um, but I mentioned the audiologist, like a lot of times people will go over to Dartmouth and get referred to go to, to the audiologist here. So, um, so the services could be provided through our school as well in that same model. It, it, it makes sense that, you know, even though it's, but we'd have to make sure that those families could get the transportation and the children could be, you know, uh, in the school itself. So if they're in another elementary school and, and part of their services, getting the hearing or the, the uh, dental care, <clears throat> having them transported to the other school for that or something like that to, to, to tie those other schools together. And I'm, I'm really kind of talking without a, a lot of, I don't have all the answers. I'm just kind of uh, really wanted to give a narrative today with uh, what we, what we, you know, have always kind of came up in research that, Hey, we're a, we're a community school. I know I, I, I was at a conference in, uh, I think it was Chicago. We were talking about building community schools and like, check, check, check. We have all those things. Um, and, and so is neat. Yeah. Representative Brown. Oh, thank you. Um, I was curious to know, so I think as we've heard um, a lot of folks from the field talk about learning re-engagement as we move through what's hopefully the end stages of COVID, um, what lessons around family engagement do you think that the community schools model can, can sort of give us to inform what those practices might look like going forward? Hmm. Good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, uh, the, everything's changed and, um, you know, we're, we, and teachers, administrators, we're, we're every day going, how are we going to get through to all of our families? You know, it, it, I, I, in my class, I have uh, 16 learners. Um, average of when we're remote, half of them, you know, attend during a day. And it's, it's, it's difficult. And it's really, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not pointing fingers or blaming anyone. But um, so we were, we, we were talking about how do you, how do you get, parents more involved. And we even thought about like having a, 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 a virtual night for parents to learn how to, to navigate doing a Zoom meeting, uh, you know, because the kids know, but the parents don't. <clears throat> or in that, in that case, um, you know, access to the, the internet's an issue um, in a lot of cases. But it, it's a lot of it is, is mostly um, just getting, getting the engagement commitment from the family. So that, that does come from you know, the school making, really putting a value on that and saying, you know, we're part of your, you're part of us. How can we help you? What can we do to, to, to make it so it's easier for you to learn in this crazy world that we're in? <clears throat> because, you know, parents just with all the, I, I, I'm fortunate my mind are grown that uh, when this happened and, um, you know, I can't imagine going through it today, but uh, it is a really difficult uh, thing to, to do. Now, you know, hopefully when we go back to normal, um, I, I do think we will someday, that uh, we can, you know, kind of go back to when we started this and, 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 set, and Rep uh, Webb and, and, and James, when you guys came down, we weren't even thinking about the pandemic at the time we were thinking about. So, so it's a different, a different monster altogether, but I, I don't know if I answered your question. No, that, that's, that's helpful, thank you. Okay. Representative Harrison. Thank you. Um, I'm following up on uh, Representative uh, Copley's and Brady's question, and, and this may not be in your wheelhouse. Uh, I'm just curious, a lot of the services that you offer probably shouldn't be figured into your per pupil costs. And, and I'm just kind of curious how you separate out those 
those two expense columns. That's that's definitely something I'm not good at. I couldn't be able to answer that with a you know honest answer. But I do know that, like for example, in my classroom, there are certain children that are identified that um, get those services. So at the beginning of the year, they let me know. It may be provided through the special ed. Uh, you know, probably I think it's Medicaid mainly that decides where that comes from. But you know, if that service was open to every every learner, like not just specifically to the ones. Uh, I just can't, I just can imagine how, how much happier people would be about like going to their school. I love my school. I can, my, my kids go to the dentist and they, they, they have the, everything's there, you know? So um, that, that is a, a difficult question. I don't know the funding issue and where it comes from today. Again, a lot of that before was, was through the, um, the family outreach group and it was a really complex thing. And I think a lot of it was um, like I said, this, this woman that was dedicated, she would, I, I don't know, you drive by on a weekend and her car was parked in the parking lot. So <clears throat> she put a lot of extra time into making all those things happen. So oh, my we, under, off. We, no, we understand that you're a third grade teacher and you're not not the master of, of the budgeting and expenses. So that is something we may be interested in, but, but we're probably... Um, Probably look more to your your the business manager. <laughs> Some of yeah, that. there's lots of people that can answer that question yeah. and and, yeah. and you know the how that works financially. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Representative James. Andrew, thanks so much for coming. I uh, <clears throat> visiting Molly was such an amazing experience to see everything that you all are doing. Um, so I just wanted to um, learn a little bit more about. Um, and I guess just check my list. I was keeping a list. So I think I know you said you offer um, universal school meals. You you said you provided free breakfast and lunch for all all learners. And then um, could you tell me a little bit more about the um, the expanded hours? I think you said that all learners can come as early as seven and stay till four thirty through your sort of early morning drop off and after school. I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that and about your summer program. And, and you, the summer program you said was open to all of your students as well, right? Yes. I'd love the, to hear a little bit more about how those programs work, um, You know what you offer during those times and how many students show up and how you think kids benefit. Because I think uh, one pillar of this bill is that expanded learning time concept. And um, it's one that's really interesting to me. It certainly will be opened up when we finally move into the census-based funding too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank I, you. I had the benefit of working a couple of years back. Uh, I actually started teaching at Molly Stark in 2004. Through budget issues, I ended up losing my position and worked in New York where I live in a charter school for seven years. And uh, the, we had an extended school day. And, and that was really beneficial for the community because most of the parents work two jobs to begin with, but but the, and that that was for every every kid. Now here, what we have is a little bit different. Um, and I and again, I know um, Dr. Abbott would be able to give us some more details on when you guys met with the the program. But the its program is, is certainly available, I think. But they have to apply for it, and then uh, it's kind of down in this separate wing, but in the early ed. So parents can drop their learners off at, at seven in the morning. And then those kids will come to their classrooms when, when the school opens at eight o'clock on a normal school year, the way it used to be. Um, and then after school at three o'clock, when they would get on the buses, if they were in that program, they would go down and go into the after school program. So I think they had maybe 20 kids in that program. And, and a lot of those uh, were parents that were working you know, full time. And I, there may have been costs that the parents partially funded, but having that available you know, at the building is really beneficial rather than transporting them from, uh, we have a, a daycare program nearby and a lot of the kids come from there on the bus. So they'll, they'll you know, that's a, another way to, to provide it. But having that available to, to the parents, you know, a lot of us either have to drive a long way or start really early. So schools just don't fit into the schedule. So that helps a lot. Um, you, you, um, the, the, the meals we have the the Abbey Group uh, that that w w is a separate uh, entity than our district, but they we hire them to feed. And I think those grants. Um, when I was doing the summer program, it's through the federal federal fun food program. Um, so we were somewhere around 80, 70 to eighty percent 
free and reduced lunch to begin with. And so we were able to get uh, um, funding to feed everyone. So there was no an equity issue where some kids, you know, got free lunch and some didn't. And so it was a, that, that was a few years now. So we've always been able to provide, and I, it's all the schools uh, in, in, in our district can provide meals for both breakfast and lunch. Um, with the pandemic, um, the, it's been really difficult for them, but they've been able to do it and they'll package meals each morning. So when our kids come in, they have a bag of breakfast um, and then that lunch is coming in the afternoon sealed and, and you know the kids have that. So they don't have to take the free lunch, but they have that opportunity to get that. Um, in the summer program, I can give you a lot of, you know, I was actually the coordinator and um, that was a great program because what it normally went was at the end of the school year, teachers would kind of feel out parents and, and the kids and say, hey, you know, you can benefit from this program if you'd like to be part of it. And if the parents agreed, then we would put them on the list. <clears throat> then I had to figure out how many teachers I needed based on the number of kids. And it usually came down to like a week before school, st summer school started when I had finally rosters in place. So it was a little stressful, but it was really great. That, and so the kids would come in at eight in the morning, eat breakfast, and then they're there until 12 o'clock. Parents pick them up. They had just had lunch. And then they ate the rest of the day. It was just Monday through Thursday as well. But um, we had science and uh, math integrated together in a class. And we had language arts and reading uh, and, and history. And, you know, so they were getting a little bit of everything. We even had a, um, uh, a gym teacher. So we could rotate and the kids had some activity as well. So it was really great. Um, really missed it last summer. I, I was just devastated when we couldn't do summer school. Sounds kind of crazy. You're like, <clears throat> but um, yeah, it was. It's really a big part of part of me. So, hope that answers that question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank um, you. Um, and do we have time for me to ask one more quick question, oh, or do we, we need do. to move we've, on? We've got, we've got about. Um, yeah, we've got about six minutes. I think. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah. I, I did have just one more question since I didn't don't, don't see any other hands up um, in in the bill, um, which really is based on model legislation from the Learning Policy Institute. Um, the 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 work is is done by a community schools coordinator. So there's a there's a funded position, um, and um, I wondered whether at Molly you have someone similar or whether that's you or whether over time um, all of these um, programs have just developed in an organic way and so everybody's running you know their own program but all moving toward the same goal yeah um i think i think this is something that is the biggest part of the, the piece like that that's the, it, in like i said i went to the chicago we talked with some of the groups in new jersey that had some really really solid community schools and it really was evolved around the leadership in that in that uh, and it, it was not necessarily always someone from the school it was someone from the community as well um that that was able to tie all those services together and 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 you know and be partners with the school so obviously uh this is an through the, it has to be tied together with the, the bill I saw. This is really important part. So it, finding that right person is, is an issue too. Like, and, and, you know, I mentioned before that person was generally doing most of that work, not being paid to do that. So that, that does require a lot of extra work and someone needs, you know, has to be designated. Could it be a, a, an employee in the school? Absolutely. Could it, could it be a, a local community member or a business leader or somebody that you know has a lot of connections to getting services um, and getting you know people together? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I, I see that that we um, we have Elizabeth Paris, who is the school nurse in Winooski here, along with Colin Robinson from the NEA. And I'd like to move on to that testimony. Andrew, you are more than welcome to stay with us um, if you need to go. <laughs> I think I'll watch on YouTube and let everybody there else take go. the floor. But thank you so much. I appreciate having me today. And thank, thank you, you so guys. much. Be safe, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. So glad I was able to visit your school. <laughs> come again, please. <laughs> we can do it on Zoom. <laughs> come visit. <laughs> thank right. you. Okay, Colin Robinson, did you want to start or you can do, how would you like to do that? Hi, Madam Chair. I think it would be great for the committee to hear from um, Liz first. Okay. 
Thank you and welcome, Liz. I'm delighted to, to welcome you. I actually worked in the Winooski School District in the 90s, so uh, remember it very fondly. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Elizabeth Paris, and I'm going to try to share my screen as I do have a um, some slides that might help you when we talk about this. Let's see. Um, is it working? Uh, not yet, but you are. You do have. There we go. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to get into my presentation. Okay. Okay. So my name is Elizabeth Paris and I am one of the school nurses in the health office coordinator for the Winooski School District. And I am here today to share with you our successful creation and implementation of a school-based health center in Winooski. Some background, um, we are under one roof located here on one campus. The Winooski School District serves approximately 800 pre-K through 12th grade students. They speak about 18 different languages and 98% of them do qualify for free and reduced lunch. Most of our students do have a primary care home. However, families do face multiple barriers to accessing care. The idea of opening a part-time school-based health center was conceived to address these barriers, and we modeled it after similar school-based health centers uh, throughout the state. Some benefits of a school-based health center are to keep the students healthy and improve health outcomes, improve access to and utilization of needed services, promote health equity in a cost-effective way, uh, big one for me, increase the educational time and improvement of academic achievement, support our families and collaborate with the medical homes. Our um, mission statement is to increase access to quality physical and mental health care services for Winooski students, reduce health care disparities and keep our students safe, healthy and well within their families and within our community. I'm going to share with you um, kind of a creation timeline so you can see exactly the work that we did to get our school based health center up and running. In October of 2016, I presented the idea of creating a school based health center in our district to our superintendent. I did receive immediate uh, approval and uh, the ability to move forward with the, the concept to see where we went. We quickly formed a multidisciplinary planning team. It consisted of members from our school. Um, it consisted of members from some local healthcare organizations and some com key community partners. We engaged multiple community stakeholders. We got buy-in from our local healthcare organizations. We applied for and did receive grant funding and exactly 12 months later, we opened the door for the first time to the school-based health center. In our school-based health center, anyone can uh, come and be seen as long as they have parental permission. However, parental uh, presence is not required. We see acute visits, follow-up visits. We do um, different services that may be requested from the child's medical home we can do um, point of care testing, rapid strep, urinalysis, urine culture, pregnancy tests. The doctors, they do order medications, they order labs and imaging just as if they were seeing the kid in their clinic. We do refer to specialty clinics as needed. And um, new this year, we did implement a flu vaccine clinic within the school-based health center, and we were able to vaccinate over 100 students. We do not offer well child checks. We do believe it's important for the children and the families to keep connected to their primary medical home. And we do not manage chronic issues of patients such as uh, type one or type two diabetes un, um, or medication management unless it is the actual patient of one of the two providers that's here or someone within their practice. 
We believe that communication, successful communication, is one of the key components of keeping our school-based health center open. So at the end of every school-based health center visit, the medical provider does connect with the families, gives them an update, and advises them on next steps. I take care of um, faxing a visit note to the child's primary care office, and then we follow up afterwards as needed with a phone call to ensure that our kids are up to date on their health supervision, and we assist with scheduling well child checks as needed. Um, during the second year of our clinic, we had noticed 33 students were overdue for their well child check, and we were able to help get 22 of them scheduled with their PCP office. Um, here are some measurable data that you may be interested in. I'm going to focus on the first and second year of the creation of the school-based health center due to the COVID pandemic last year and with the hybrid learning model and having to pivot into remote learning this year, um, the data is just not an accurate representation of what the clinic really does. So we'll just focus on years one and two. In the first year, we were open for 37 clinic days. And what that looks like is every Tuesday and Thursday morning, um, a provider would come and see the kids. Um, the first year we had 149 visits, 110 of which were unique. They saw between two and six students a day, averaging about four, a school-based health center day. The following year, there were 56 clinic days, 348 visits. That's important to note as we move to the next slide. 225 um, students were unique, and they averaged anywhere from two to 15 visits per day that they were open with an average of six kids. In the first year, 70% were scheduled. The rest were walk-ins. No one was turned away due to the lack of time. Um, in 2018-19, 94% were scheduled. The rest were walk-ins. We did have to turn away 5% due to the lack of time. So we went back to the drawing board and collaborated with the medical homes. And each medical home agreed to allow the, their providers to have a full block in the morning, which meant an extra hour each um, day that they were here in order to be able to see all of the kids scheduled in any possible walk-ins last year before we went remote and this year during, during our um, hybrid slash in-person model, no child has been turned away. So what happens at these visits? In year one, they prescribed 42, 42% um, of the kids did receive some type of prescription, mainly in the form of an antibiotic. The second year, 29% received prescriptions. Um, in both years, it was a total of 3% of the kids seen needed some type of imaging um, or x-rays. And the, the last one is laboratory testing. 8% needed additional point of care testing or blood work. And in 2018-19, uh, 19% needed it. This is probably the slide that gets me the most excited because this was my whole desire for creating the school-based health center here in Winooski. 89% of the kids that were seen in our school-based health center got to stay in school. That meant they didn't need to be early dismissed for a doctor's appointment. They were not tardy because of a doctor's appointment. They were not um, staying home for the day just because they had something that needed to be followed up eventually at the doctor's. This was huge. This was my goal and I'm very thankful it happened. 8% um, unfortunately did have to go home and 1% did need to go on to the uh, emergency room for follow-up care, but 89% got to stay in school. Of those 89% that stayed in school, 75% required no follow-up, 15% did follow up with their primary care home, 9% had a follow-up in the school-based health center, and 1% needed a specialty follow-up. Just a note about our funding and how we were able to get our school-based health center off the ground. The space was donated by the Winooski School District. I'm sitting in one of the rooms now. Um, the provider time allotted by the University of Vermont Medical Center Primary Pediatrics and the Community Health Centers of Burlington. Providers would bill for their uh, services. Routine supplies were provided by both primary peds and community health center. The startup cost, the nurse coordinator time, and the commu uh, community 
Advisory Council were funded by three separate grants. We applied for and did receive funding through the Children's Miracle Network, the UVMMC Community Health Investment Fund, and the CATCH grant. We are currently in our fourth year. We are now financially viable without the need for further grants. Our data continues to demonstrate an ongoing need for the school-based health center, ongoing assessment of increasing our school-based health center days and hours is happening. We are expanding here in Winooski. We have a multi-million dollar construction project that is currently going. We hope to have the health office in our new home by May of 2022, at which point um, one, if not both of the doctors are hoping to be able to spend a full day here once a week to provide services to the kids. I hope that this work inspires um, this committee as you consider the H106 bill. Any questions? Thank you so much. I want to open it up to questions. So it just, just I'll start with, so this is four years later, but it was really, it took you about just a couple of years probably to really get up to speed, would you say? Or how long, how long did it take you? Um, well, the desire to have a school-based health center was there for a few years. However, you do need a pediatric physician or a family medicine physician to co-lead. Uh, and at the time that we had considered this, there was no one available. Until 2016, a pediatric resident by the name of Dr. Anna Zuckerman through Primary Peds took this on as her advocacy project. And we spent 2006, October of 2016 until October of 2017 um, forming our school-based health center and to what it is today. So you're more urban location and access to the medical center certainly made this an awful lot easier probably for you. Yes, we did um, have to, we, we made a point of connecting with all of the local um, pediatric and family medicine offices in Chittenden County and offering them buy-in to this program and the ability to come over here. Two clinics did accept our proposal and were willing to send staff over. And that was Primary Peds, which is through UVMMC and the Community Health Centers of Burlington. It is important to note that probably 60 to 70% of our student population do attend Primary Peds and probably 20% attend Community Health Centers of Burlington. So by having those two large organizations um, be willing to come to the table and provide us with medical providers for two school school based health center days was so invaluable because it's just really um, a collaborative approach to taking these kids under their wings and making sure they have what they need. Thank you, Representative James and then Brady. Thank you. Um, that is so, that's so interesting to me. I, so I wanna make sure I understand um, how it works and who's pitching in what. So the school district provided the space and then the healthcare providers, um, uh, they, you said they agreed to provide routine supplies and also basically, and this is the big thing, to send their staff over. That's correct. So, so are they sending docs or nurse practitioners or does it depend on the day? We have consistent providers. So currently we have um, Dr. Heather Link, who is a pediatrician through Primary Peds and Elizabeth McDonald, who is a nurse practitioner through Primary Peds. They share the responsibility for Primary Peds. And then we have Sherry LaRose, who is a physician assistant through the Community Health Centers of Burlington. And so, and then the, the billing works just like it normally would, whatever insurance the students have that's right. So nothing changes about the billing. So That's what's what's innovative um, is the fact that students have to don't have to go to their doc. The doc comes to them, That's and so right. the partnership there is that when it, is that the school district provides the space and the coordination and a lot of the logistical work in making this happen. The docs come and provide some routine supplies and then nothing is different about billing. It would be as if the student had gone to the, the doctor's office. 
Right. The biggest difference being the student gets to remain in class until two minutes before, right? right? The doctor's ready. And then 15 minutes after the visit, they're back upstairs in their class learning. And our single moms are still on the job and right. they're having to leave work to um, come get their child because they're sick and they can't stay in school. That's well, really one of our biggest goals is to okay. keep the, the parents at work if possible and to keep these kids in school learning. That's great. So the access and transportation barriers are just poof. Gone. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Keeps kids in school and parents working. <laughs> um, what is your percentage of new Americans in Winooski? Hi, I think um, off the top of my head, probably over 50%. Thank you. Representative Brady. Thank you. You mostly asked my question, Representative James. I was trying to make sure I was straight on the billing. So I wonder, given the student population and the high poverty rate in the uh, student population, so um, most, I'm guessing, are on some kind. Are their health insurance is is through a public, um, you know, publicly supported? Do you find then in the clinic you have to, you are helping families navigate that at all? Um, is it helping getting people registered? Do, do you have, you know, what happens if a child isn't on a plan already? Are you able to provide some services to sort of connect that family with what they might qualify for and how to do that? Mm -hmm. So 98% of our kids um, here in the district are on Medicaid. Um, and for families whose Medicaid has lapsed or they do not have Medicaid, we do not turn them away. The doctors still see them. The community health centers of Burlington have a sliding scale for patients that do not have insurance based on their income. They work with that. Primary PEDS sets up their own alternative program to reach and to work with the families if needed. Um, but they both have social workers on site that we can connect with that then work with the families to get either their Medicaid reinstated or to get them signed up for Medicaid. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you so much. This is, a, it's really exciting to hear what you've accomplished um, you. in Winooski. Um, it's just very exciting. I, I continue to, to wonder, um, given the access that you have in Winooski to, to other services, how, how I, I suppose in other communities they'll, they'll be accessing different resources. So I think I'm going to leave that as my own question going forward. I'm not asking you to think about other communities when you've done so well with your own. Um, any other questions? Colin, do you want to add anything at this point? Colin Robinson. Thank yes, you. thank you, Chair okay. Webb. Yeah. Um, good to see everybody and thanks for having me. Uh, as a former resident of Winooski, it is Always wonderful to hear about the amazing things the Winooski schools are doing. So thanks, Elizabeth, for sharing your perspective. And thanks, committee, for taking time on this issue. Um, I have some prepared remarks that you can see on their website, um, but I'll kind of pull some key components out as it relates to H106. So for the record, I'm Colin Robinson, I'm the political director at Vermont NEA. I think the testimony you just heard sort of speaks to the value and import of H106 and the pilots that are contemplated in the bill. Um, and obviously we all know that COVID-19 has exposed a lot of societal challenges and complexities that our students and families and all citizens have been facing for a long time. For those of you that have been on this committee for some time, you'll know that whether it's classroom educators, nurses, administrators, school board members, they've all been talking about the incredible complex needs students and families have been coming to and bringing with them to school for a long time, for the past uh, decade or so in particular. And the pandemic has only exacerbated that. Um, and that's why the legislature in previous sessions has looked at things like adverse childhood experiences and how do you support students in their ability to learn because our members, uh, and I think all of you know, that a student can only access their learning when they're able to have their basic needs met, when they feel safe, when they feel like um, they're in a place where that learning is gonna allow them to be successful. And that's sort of the promise of H106, you know, that we can pilot out some of the good work that 
many communities like Winooski and in Molly Stark and Bennington are already doing, build upon that work. And perhaps some of those communities say, we want to take it to a next level or places where they've had some conversations um, about trying to make a step in this direction because they know their student needs are so great and the community needs are so great. You know, the reality is schools are doing a lot of things that schools weren't doing 50 years ago, let alone 15 years ago. I mean, schools now have um, and I'm sure Liz and others can speak to this as well as anybody, but you know, things like uh, washer and dryer. So you can clean kids clothing because that's not something they have access to at home. And in order for students to feel like they're gonna be able to be a successful learner, they need to feel like they have dignity and, and self-worth in who they are, right? So to that end, um, what H106 is building upon is a national, trend in a national model. There are 5,000 quote unquote community schools across the nation. And I think next week, the committee is gonna have an opportunity to learn from the Learning Policy Institute about this model and what it looks like in places across the country. And I think what makes it really exciting in a Vermont context is our schools are already the heart and center of our community in so many ways. And people see them as institutions that serve multiple purposes already. So the, there isn't sort of a cognitive barrier to this notion that a school would also be a place where, you know, maybe you're having seniors come and um, get their audiology services. Maybe you have parents coming in to receive some additional supports around um, completing their reach up benefits. So they don't have to drive 45 minutes to the closest DCF office to do that. Um, because people already understand that our community centers are our schools. So a couple specific things around H106, and I, I heard the Deputy Secretary's testimony um, earlier this week, and I just wanted to speak to that briefly. Yeah, so um, first of all, I just want to say, I think the time is now, and I think Representative Brady used the term kind of turbocharge, um, that I think is really appropriate for this moment. I think as I, I said, and I think you all know, the challenges of the pandemic have only exacerbated existing issues and schools are trying to work to figure out how we support our students and families as we emerge from this pandemic. And waiting to do this because it is a pilot, we don't believe is necessary. We believe that since it is a challenge by choice model, this is not saying you have to do this. This is saying, hey, if you're ready to do this, here's some additional resources for you to step into this work, to embrace this work, to build community, additional community input, um, and perhaps build upon either successful work that's already going on in your recovery plans or successful work that places like Winooski and Molly Stark have been doing, and they want to deepen into this even more. So those kind of two, two points. Is it challenged by choice? And we do believe that the time is now. Um, the deputy secretary spoke to the grant amount and uh, definitely you sort of understand that point and think that there's probably uh, reason to consider what she was talking about in terms of removing some of the kind of specific metrics in there. What I do think would be important for the committee to consider if that is a direction you're going is thinking about having a minimum number of pilots because we don't want a situation where one district comes in with a proposal that takes up you know, two thirds of the allowable amount, right? Um, not because they might not have great ideas and wanting to do good work, but if the true idea is to build out a number of pilots that you can look back on in a couple of years and say, ooh, this really worked here. This is a place where we can build out. You wanna have a certain number of pilots out in the field. Obviously the build currently is built around the concept of 10. Um, I think 10 is a, is a nice number, um, but perhaps there's a way to build in some flexibility around the, the amounts there that the deputy secretary spoke to. The other points around the grant specifically um, that she mentioned in her testimony seemed, seemed fine and appropriate. The final point I wanna lift up in, in this conversation as you move forward is this notion of a community schools coordinator position. I think we can all think of really great ideas 
that we've experienced in our community space or in our work and uh, whatever that might look like that haven't reached their full potential because there some, wasn't one person owning that work. And I think what you heard in uh, the presentation about Winooski is that Elizabeth really owned this work. Like this was a, a, a deep passion of hers to bring to fruition. And, um, and I think that that points to the need for somebody to own this work. And I think you also heard in um, Andrew Labarge's testimony that Molly Stark's model emerged with, he kind of referenced somebody who was there on the weekends and in the parking, parked in the parking lot. It was because there was a, my understanding is there was a, a specific staff member that had a vision and wanted to help create that vision and make it a reality to support students and families. And I think one of the challenges that um, when Representative James and Representative Webb were down there might have heard in Molly Stark is that some of those things have not, they're not existing at the level that they perhaps were 10 or 15 years ago when there was ability to have somebody who was owning that work. So I just want to lift up the notion of having a community schools coordinator is really important and impactful to the fidelity of the, the community schools model. Because when you have somebody who owns that work, who's able to build lasting deep relationships with community stakeholders to maximize those resources like has been done in Winooski, where it's, it's not adding to school costs, but rather bringing in resources that help build out student supports so they can actually be successful learners. That's what we're talking about because, you know, public schools do so much to support children and families, but they bring with them so much to their schools and that impact their ability to learn. And if we're able to break down barriers and build connectivity inside a school setting to help our students be even more successful, that's the promise of H106. And that's the promise of the community schools model. And more importantly, I think that's the opportunity that we have now as we look to recovery from pandemic. So I'll pause there, happy to answer questions, but really appreciate that your committee is taking consideration of this and that you're talking with the appropriations committee about the resources to make this happen. Sorry. Um, questions, comments, Representative James? Um, yeah, just a comment. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for being here. Um, I did have uh, Aaron, uh, Rep Brady and I did have uh, a check-in last night with um, Deputy Secretary Boucher. And um, a solution I think we came up with to your question about the grant amount was that we simply say that the grants uh, would provide up to $110,000 um, so that if there were a small school that applied um, where that needed less funding, um, that that would be okay um, so that we might potentially wind up funding more than 10 grants. So I, I think, I hope you agree that that was sort of an elegant solution. <laughs> that, that sounds wonderful. And I appreciate that you both were able to dig into that a little bit because when I heard this testimony, I was understood the intent, but wanted to make sure that we didn't lose opportunity as well. Yeah, and um, we talked kind of at length about the community school coordinator position, and I think we're all in agreement that that's the heart of the grant. So, um, I mean, the heart of the program. Elizabeth so. Paris, in terms of planning, would that, does that seem like a reasonable uh, amount <laughs> from your experience? Yes, I mean, I think um, grant-wise, we ended up with in the ballpark of like 20 to maybe 30,000 to get started up, but that included some equipment that was needed, um, vaccine refrigeration. Um, we also paid an additional nurse for uh, some time to come in and actually measure all of this data, collect it all and measure it all. And um, so she did get paid a stipend. We formed an advisory council, which we still have it meets three times a year and we use some of that grant money to pay those staff members and students who stay after school to chat about um, the school-based health center and next steps. So overall, that's pretty much where we were at. Thank you. Representative Brady.
lowered my hand, but didn't unmute. I uh, just want to make sure, Colin, you're comfortable with the language around extended time. Um, but I certainly support that. I think it's really important. Also know teacher time and exactly how that is accounted for can get sticky sometimes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, thanks uh, for that question. I think, you know, we would, one of the most, the things that make community schools successful is there's deep buy-in from the full community and conversation among all stakeholders. And in the, that's why teacher voice is really important to be part of it. And we think in order for it to be successful, that needs to be part of it. So we would expect that those conversations would happen at the local level um, because, you know, as I think you've heard from the two educators today, there is a deep passion and commitment to the success of, of students and a willingness to sort of figure out what that would look like at the nitty gritty level at the local, in local conversations. So appreciate you flagging that and appreciate the question. Representative Arison. First Chair Webb, uh, I want to go last because I want to veer off of Route one, of, uh, <laughs> Act 106. Well, we got Colin online, but I want your permission. Okay, I want to keep us focused on this topic first. Um, that, that's fine. Community schools. Representative Conlon. Uh, thanks. Uh, my question is similar to what I asked um, with Mr. Labarge, the teacher from Molly Stark. And I don't know, this will, I'll send it to my committee members as well as to Colin or anyone else. But uh, it's again, it's this question of scale and size. And, you know, many of our elementary schools in Vermont are smaller than 100. Some are smaller than 50. And I'm just, you know, thinking to myself, you know, how many schools in Vermont can take advantage of this in a, in a way that it would be highly effective? Um, and if there's a, a question about, you know, what is sort of a, what, what it might be a minimum size that would allow for an effective community school? Kind of a rhetorical question. If anybody wants to respond, they're welcome to. I'm happy well, to hear from Colin. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Representative Conlon, a couple things. One is I think that would actually be a really great question for the Learning Policy Institute, because I'm sure they could draw upon some experience and knowledge they have from nationwide. I think one of the other things about sort of the pilot notion is in part to try and figure that out a little bit too, you know. Um, to figure out where it is scalable, where maybe um, we need to think about things perhaps a little bit differently. Um, but most importantly, I think that with the granting process, you know, that would be the place where the school would need to, quite frankly, do that assessment and demonstrate the potential efficacy and ability for their school of whatever size they're envisioning or district um, to be able to deploy this model and this grant in an effective way. Um, because once again, it really comes down to kind of the, the local community buy-in to be successful. So, um, but I think the Learning Policy Institute might be able to answer it even more specifically based upon stuff that they know from other parts of the country as well. Uh, Representative James and then Brady, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, in the in its most very recent iteration, um, Rep. Conlon, we tried to address that concern because I had the same thought um, by expanding that language a little bit, um, especially since I learned, which I didn't know anyway, that schools aren't fiscal agents. Um, so uh, it now says that the coordinator could be full or part time. And then it would allow a district to apply um, on behalf of eligible and eligible school or schools. So there could be sort of a little bit more of a regional approach. Um, and that's where the granting process and the testing of this really becomes interesting because then I started in my mind having the question of, well, then how, how big or how dispersed does it become to not be a community school? <laughs> so uh, you know, then it's a, a regional approach. So, but anyway, we thought because of that exact question, we thought it might be interesting in the bill 
to say that the coordinator could be full or part-time and that a district could apply on behalf of a school or a, a several schools. Some of that may, may be for council in drafting. Yeah, Jim already it did that. Yeah. yeah, Jim was in our meeting with Dr. Boucher. Okay. I, I was just gonna to follow up to that point that um, uh, maybe, I, I don't know, uh, depending on the free and reduced uh, lunch numbers, but you know, maybe there are scenarios where there are uh, districts that have small schools that are you know, facing closure questions, all of the seven days cover story this week, um, that uh, you know, is, is there potentially, if not in the pilot, eventually in something like this, a way that, it, that a coordinator is helping to coordinate services in a school, but also helping to repurpose, I'm not sure I like that word, a school into some other kind of community asset that still has a very community-based kid-centered, you know, maybe it's a library resource, maybe it's a partial health resource, and, you know, that, that, that it's maybe, 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 huge maybes here, another avenue at how we deal with these really small schools and the challenges in some parts of our state. Um, I don't know, that, that was a new thought to me this week in, in some of, um, <clears throat> as we've just talked about it further. And uh, just to represent James's, uh, sorry, represent Brady's point real quick. Um, you know, our, our uh, former Vermont AA president, Martha Allen lives in Canaan, you know, and if you've ever been to Canaan, Canaan's awful far away from basically everything um, and has a deep, uh, affinity for our rural communities. And when she first started talking about the notion of community schools and full service schools, it was exactly as you're talking about Representative Brady, this notion that, you know, our, our schools do exist sometimes as the lone institution in a town. Uh, you know, if the general store doesn't exist, maybe this school still exists. And without the school, well, what is there? And um, is there a way to think creatively about creating other supports for the whole community um, as we figure out, you know, our, and our communities evolve. So just wanted to lift up that point. Thank you. I actually am gonna send you a, a map that I got from um, the AOE last year that actually is a map that shows the definition of all our school districts and where all the schools are, uh, which I find incredibly helpful in getting a picture of where we are. So I will, I will send that to Jesse and make it available to everybody. It's actually quite helpful as we're thinking, especially when you see off in the corner, the little cane in school, <laughs> it, it, it puts some things into perspective. Um, are there any further questions that are, that are related to this topic? I know that uh, Kathleen at uh, Representative James and Brady were working on this. I forgot that I wanted to also have a Republican in that group and I forgot to, to, forgot to connect you. And I, I think uh, Representative Tooth and I had talked about maybe him doing it. I don't know if it's you, then I'm remembering there's also Representative Williams who's up in that corner might be a possibility. So uh, I'm just gonna encourage you to, in some of the small group conversations to include one of our um, Republicans. And if I just forgot one, I'm really sorry. That would be great, one, one or both. Um, Jim is working on a uh, updated version of the bill um, that will incorporate all of Secretary um, Boucher's kind of comments and concerns. So I think she'll be, um, you know, I think AOE will be supportive, um, I hope. And um, we are planning to meet with the V's on Monday. So maybe y'all could join us. Just like to make sure that we're keeping our party sorted out here. Yep, thanks, Kate. I wasn't even thinking of party, to be honest. Yeah. I, I know because we're, we're, we're all, we we're don't, we're a good group, but yep, we're, we're a good group. Okay. But we need to remember that. Yeah, okay. and Casey and I have been talking, or sorry, Representative Tuf and I have been talking about this bill um, since before we started session. And I know he's interested. Great. And I also don't want to get too big, but I just want to make sure that we have, have different voices involved in, in the small group, the group that I, I, I think is going to the cafeteria, sitting around the table and hammering out these details to bring back to the community. Great. So the Thanks committee. for that reminder. That's good. Is the way I always picture this is you're all in the cafeteria. Um, so with that, I uh, very interesting conversation. Uh, greatly appreciate this, um, Elizabeth Paris. I very much 
we had two of your students come and perform last year. Uh, your beautiful two students and, you know, our PA system didn't work well for them, but fortunately we have that beautiful video uh, of them and it was really moving. It was sort of, it might have even been the last day before we shut down the legislature that they were here. It's pretty beautiful. I'll, I'll make that that available to other members of the community as, the, of the committee as well, because it's really moving. Um, so with that, then I, I will, um, Representative Arison, if you had another, another uh, relevant, um, not necessarily to this topic, but um, question for yeah, you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, while, while Colin's here, and it's not a direct connection to the NEA, but uh, it, uh, it's definitely a connection to the committee and the NEA may want to weigh in on this. There's a local uh, paper that's distributed probably from Ludlow all the way down into Westminster. It, it's a mailbox paper, so it's so a lot of homes get it. And on the front page is an interview with the superintendent of the Wyndham Northeast District. And he is said that Act 73 is gonna cost their district $1 million. A, he doesn't know that, so it's misinformation. And B, this committee is, is mentioned in the, in the article. Uh, I guess my point is that we're just a few weeks from school uh, budgets being voted and for a superintendent to be spreading misinformation or potentially misinformation and citing this committee, I find a little bit disturbing. And I don't know, Colin, if you want, once again, if you punt, I'm perfectly fine. Um, all I would say is I, if it was, um, I grew up in, in Putney in Wyndham Southeast, so I'm geographically familiar with Wyndham Northeast. I would just say that that is a district that I know has been going through a lot of um, challenging governance conversations um, related to all the things that uh, have been before this committee, past and present. Um, so I only offer that as kind of a commentary to, I think, some of the challenges that that district in particular has going on right now. I think um, I think they're also one where I believe it's Grafton and Wyndham are trying to correct extract themselves from the district. So I I I, I don't know anything beyond that. I will say um, on you know 173 obviously there is a direct connection to the waiting study and that's something that I, I shared and spoke to in this committee the other week. Um, I have no comments on sort of his specific remarks. Um, this may also be related to excess spending threshold, crossing the excess spending threshold. I didn't see the article, but uh, we are going to be addressing that on Tuesday. That will be, we will bring back H35. Um, I will be uh, at that time seeking um, a motion to approve. And uh, that would um, get rid of the excess spending threshold for uh, construction related issues. Um, and so if I, I will be making that, that available to the committee, which would mean that it would then, if we pass that, if we agree to that, then it would go over to Ways and Means. Um, anything else then before we end? And if you, I'd love to see that article. I don't know what article you're, you're talking about. Um, so feel free to- I'll, I'll get it to you. Thank you. Colin, it's not often that you get asked to speak for the superintendents. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I hope I didn't, but- uh, You did not. <laughs> but it, it, is, it is a district that has been dealing with a lot of transition yeah. and challenges, so. All I can say is he didn't do anything to, to enhance the chances of their budget being passed. It's a tough time. Okay, um, so we are finished for today. Um, we'll just take a quick look. I, I think Jesse and I are still working on our Tuesday schedule. Um, and Jesse, you, you and I can have a chat um, afterwards just to see where we are. Do, do you have anything you can tell us for Tuesday? I certainly can. And I wanna say to Elizabeth and Colin, you're more than welcome to stay, but please also feel free to leave as we work on our scheduling. Thank you. I thank really you so appreciate much. this opportunity and thank you all for your time. Have a nice day. You too. Thanks.
Um, Jesse, do we have a, any picture of when we're starting on Tuesday yet? I know we're still working on quite a few items. Absolutely. So uh, for right now, um, obviously Tuesday morning sometimes is difficult to schedule with caucuses, but I have a committee discussion on construction in the morning, if possible. And then uh, following that in the afternoon at one o'clock, we'll be hearing uh, on community schools from Anna Mayer at the Learning Policy Institute. Yeah. Following that, we have the H35 committee vote, excess spending. Uh, two o'clock, we have some, it's a bit of a mix up. I'm sorry, I, I was trying to keep it consecutive with topics, but I think that maybe more of a rest of the week <laughs> yeah. situation. Uh, so two o'clock will be literacy and we'll be hearing um, from Katie Ballard and a few others. And uh, that's all I have for right now, but I'm hoping to fit in the state board following that for on Wednesday. Right. I have, I have a lot for the rest of the week, but that's just a quick glance at Tuesday. Um, I am looking uh, for us to be at a point where we can actually move the construct the the, the the construction bill. Um, so keep that in mind uh, as we're going forward. Uh, literacy, we're not quite ready yet. Um, and you, you're going to hear some lived, lived experiences next week from some people that, that spent quite a bit of time in our committee last year who um, have family members that have struggled with, with learning to read. Um, what's our third bill? <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll have, yeah, we have that done. School facilities. 106. Oh, yeah. <laughs> This bill. We just just yeah. <laughs> Perhaps I said that too quietly. I was trying to be. <laughs> yeah. Polite. They're trying to whisper to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're good. Uh, I think that's a sign that, that we're done for the day.